All right, let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of our lives. So ask you, Lord, as we come here today, that as we come here to learn more about your movements as you shaped human history, as you came into the world to change the human race for the better, to bring about the kingdom of God into the here and now, we just ask you, Lord, to take away the weariness from the day, enlighten our minds with the spirit of wisdom, help us to understand more fully your presence within our human history and where you're still moving and acting in our lives and in the world today. And we ask all this through the intercession and the words which Christ gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Huh? Uh, this is actually going to the camera, so it's actually not... I'll, I'll, but I will speak loudly so everyone can hear. If you can't hear me in the back, just raise your hand, and I'll... Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, welcome to this course on church history as we go through about the first 1,400 years of the Catholic Church and what was going on in history and how history as well as the political events and the society kind of shaped the Catholic Church and how the church also shaped history. And so as we begin this course, for many, some of you here, you are here because of the RCIA process and you're interested in learning more about the faith. Some of you are here are already Catholic and have been Catholic for a long time and would like to grow in your understanding. But as we come here today, to understand really the Catholic Church, you really have to understand her history because we have about 2,000 years now or 2,000 and what, 16 years, or maybe subtract 30 years from that for Christ's actual life on earth. But you can most certainly say that Jesus, the historical figure of Christ, as all of us in this room are been called here by this man, by Jesus, the man who we also claim and call God, has inevitably is the most influential person in history, is that Jesus has shaped not only Western society, but you can even look into those areas of the East, and those areas on the planet where still Christ has not been accepted wholeheartedly by the entire population. And still you can't deny the fact that Christ and his message and also Christ and his church, the Catholic Church, has shaped the course of human events. And so, but to understand Jesus and to understand the Catholic Church, also when you understand the Catholic Church's history, you'll understand why the church teaches certain things. Because we believe that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has been guiding the Catholic Church for the last 2,000 years, ever since Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Assumption of Mary, where we believe that Mary was snatched up by her son and was brought into heaven. And that Mary, everything that we believe as Catholics about Mary, is also potentially true about us. And so Jesus shaped human history, but is ultimately guiding us to something even beyond history, beyond time, to our true homeland. But to understand the Catholic Church and to understand what the Church teaches, it's very important to understand Jesus, the historical times, as well as how the Church has moved and acted throughout history, because the Church is still telling us certain things about our own human history today and how we're called to act and how we're called to move. So, Jesus, let's see if my clicker actually will work. To understand Jesus, you have to understand the period of time as well as the area of the world. Jesus comes from the Middle East, which all of us know by watching on the TV and watching news, all the different wars that are going on right now in the Middle East in terms of ISIS. But really, this is not something which is new because the Middle East has always been a hotbed of political and social contention. And at the time of Jesus, this was what was going on in Israel was very similar. They had, the Jews had expelled, not too long actually before Christ, the Greeks under Alexander the Great and his successors. After a long period of time, the Jews had expelled the Greeks finally from their territory with actually the help of Rome. And now at the time of Christ, Jesus is that you will find that the Roman occupation also of Israel is that the Jews are finding this to be oppressive. But to understand Jesus, you also understand the history of the Jews. And some of us might be familiar, but I'm just going to kind of recap, especially in this, really the Jewish race and what was going on within the Jews and where the Jews came from. So, the state of Israel, especially at the time of Jesus, expected a Messiah to come. Those of you who have read the scriptures and are familiar with King David, the type of Messiah that the Jews were expecting was predominantly a Davidic Messiah. They were expecting 
a person who was going to come and save them, very similarly to the way that King David had saved them from the Philistines in the past. It is that they saw that this foreign oppressor, Rome at the time of Christ, but going back, they'd had many foreign oppressors. Again, they'd had the Greeks before the Romans. Before that, they'd had the Babylonians. Before that, they'd had the Assyrians. Going back before that, they'd had the Edomites and the Philistines. And so what the Jews were expecting at the time of Christ was that they were expecting a military leader to come and to save them. And they had actually had many messiahs. There have been many messiah figures up until the point where Christ comes into human history. And all of their, actually the most recent, one of the most recent messiahs that had recently come on the scene and everyone had placed a lot of their hope in was a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel had been the, one of the most recent messiahs, but his rebellion actually failed. And so they were looking for the next messiah, the next person who would finally bring them freedom from foreign oppression, freedom where they could survive as an economic power, as a political power, but also where they had freedom of faith. Um, and actually, for the most part, under the Romans, they had freedom of faith, but they didn't have the freedom of economy that they wanted that they had heavy taxation. This is actually a main theme within the Gospels, is the idea of the Roman tax as well as the temple tax and all the taxes which they found very, very burdensome. And so what they were expecting was they were expecting a Messiah to come and to free them. And this will actually explain one of the classes of peoples who were actually present at the time of Jesus. But this Messiah that they're expecting, they're expecting a military leader, a person who, like King David, had cut off the head of the Philistine, they're looking someone to get rid of the Romans. Not all of them, because the history is actually a little bit more complicated than that. But when you look at King David's empire, King David, who was the first Jewish king to establish a concrete state of Israel. The Jews had, under Moses, come into the Promised Land probably around the years 1800 to 1600. At some point, Moses had taken, they'd spent 80 years in the desert, they'd finally come into the Promised Land. But just because they came into the Promised Land, they were still fighting for a long period of time with the local tribes, with the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, all the different surrounding tribes, the Philistians from Philistia, the Phoenicians, and these tribes that they will actually dispossess from the land. They will move them out of the land and they will take over. They will still be in constant conflict for a long period of time until finally you have the first king of Israel who's King Saul. And you can read about King Saul in the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel pretty much lays out the kingdom of Saul. Because up until that time, they really didn't have a monarchy. They were ruled by judges, which you can read about in the book of Judges, which comes before Samuel. So in that, during that period of time, though, the king, people of Israel, during the time of the judges, where they have many judges who rule them, the judges, they will come and they will tell the Samuel, the prophet, that they, we want a king like all the other nations. Samuel will tell them, no, you don't. And because if you get a king, then you will be ruled like all the other nations. And they say, well, we want to be like all the other nations. And Samuel will tell them, God is meant to be your king. Because in order to understand Jesus, there's a reason why I'm talking about this. In order to understand Jesus, you have to understand also the Jewish understanding of the king. And actually, the reality, even at the time where they accept a first king, because the word king and Messiah are very similar, is that they are told, God is meant to be your king. God is meant to be, because a king, if you open up that word king in the ancient world, a king, and this is not just true for the Israelites, this was true for pretty much all of the different nations, or many of the different nations, is that, is there an open, there's some open, open seat up there. Welcome. <clears throat> a king was understood to be several things. One, a king had to be the ideal the ideal of the land, the ideal person that you're trying and striving to be like. Actually, the reason why Saul, King Saul, their first king, is chosen is because he's known to be very strong, he's very powerful, everyone wants to be like him. And so King Saul is chosen, but what they end up with King Saul is actually a person who's very selfish, a man who's very prideful, and actually a person who will lead, actually, the people of Israel into destruction. That's actually where King David will arise. And you can read about the conflicts between David and Saul's families in the first book of Samuel. But as they come, it's interesting because King David, when he's chosen as king of Israel, he's actually chosen specifically because he's the runt. He's chosen as the small, because he's the youngest brother. He's, the, he's not a big strapping warrior. All of his other brothers are recognized as being very large and very strapping. David is the shepherd. He's kind of sent off in the fields. He's known to be handsome and ruddy, but for the most part, 
He is the meekest. He's the lowest lowly of all the brothers. He has really no hopes and expectations. And this is who God chooses as the second king of Israel to actually show the people of Israel, one, that Saul and all their human expectations are actually leading them astray. Their human perceptions of what they think that they want is not actually satisfying. Welcome. You come in. I don't know if there's any seats left, but you're welcome. So, King David, though, as David takes over, and most of us, I mean, who here knows the story of King David? A few. So King David will take over the kingdom. King David is, for the most part, much better than King Saul, but still a man who's very broken, a man who at times leads the people astray. But David's heart is actually, David is the only person in Scripture who's called a man after God's own heart. And the only reason why David is called a man after God's own heart, because David actually breaks pretty much every commandment you can possibly break. David uh, commits the sin of adultery. He commits the sin of murder by killing, actually, the husband of the woman he commits adultery with. He will be also considered a betrayer, is that Uriah the Hittite who he betrays. He betrays one of his closest friends. Uriah is not just um, anybody. If you go back and you know who Uriah was, Uriah was one of the few people who had actually followed David, King David, into exile when he was in conflict with Saul. He was actually one of his band of 30, and you can find this in the book of Chronicles. If you look at the book of Chronicles, you'll realize that Uriah had left everything. He wasn't even a Jew and followed David because he believed in him. So David murders him. He commits adultery. He directly is disobedient to God's command not to census, not to count the people. And God tells the kings of Israel they're not to count the people because otherwise they will grow in pride. And so David pretty much breaks every possible commandment you can do. And yet David is the only person called a man after God's own heart. And the reason for it, it has nothing to do with his sin. It has to do with David when he is, his sin is thrown in his face. Because everyone else, for the most part, in the Old Testament... When people are confronted with their sinfulness, when they're confronted with their guilt, everyone else, for the most part, passes the buck. Adam passes the buck onto Eve. Eve passes the buck onto the serpent. Again, you find that even Abraham doesn't take responsibility for the things that he's done. He will, you'll find that Isaac, again, Jacob, Jacob especially, will pass the buck. Jacob is actually will deceive his brother, will never really own up to their sinfulness. Pretty much across the board, everyone will pass the buck, will rationalize, will explain it away. David is one of the only people, actually he's the only one in Scripture, who when he's confronted with his horrible sin, he will say, I did it. He'll say, I did it. Because David is humble. He's the humble shepherd king. He's the one person who will claim his sin. He will actually own up to his sin. He will, and he will do public penance, actually, for it. He will do his penance. He will actually embrace it. He'll actually even to the point where he'll say that I deserve death. It's interesting because David's sins will actually not usually, he will not have to account for his sins personally. It'll be his sons who will have to make an accounting for David's sins. If you know the story of David, his sons will end up rebelling against him. His sons will, for the most part, take on the brunt of David's sins. And I say that because that's also indicative of who the new Messiah will come and be be someone who will actually parallel David because in 2 Samuel chapter 7 there is a Messiah who during the reign the second reign of the monarchy the second uh, during the reign of the second monarchy during King David's time is that God will make a covenant with David and the covenant which is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7 it says that from the root and stump of Jesse that the Messiah the savior will be born and it's because of David's faithfulness it's because of David's honesty and it's because of humility. And so this notion of the, of the king, though, and history and how the Jews will remember King David, though, they will remember King David for the most part for his military might. Now, you will find still the stories of his humility and those other things, but you'll still find these two competing understandings of what a Messiah is meant to be in the history of Israel. And actually the expectations, the common expectation of everyone's understanding of what a Messiah will be Many of them will also think of King David. And again, we still have, that's Michelangelo's statue. Or they'll think of him as being someone like David's son, King Solomon. King Solomon, who is recognized, and actually we still have legends of Solomon being the wisest man to ever rule, and actually one of the wisest men who has ever lived on earth. What people also don't recognize is that about Solomon is that Solomon's sin will lead the people astray. Solomon will disobey God's commandments once again when he takes foreign women. The Jews were not allowed to marry foreign women. He will marry the 
queen of, uh, of Sheba. He will take many different women, just like he will learn this from his father, David, who also had a problem with women. And that Solomon, but Solomon is recognized as, as actually being the most preeminent, predominant king who brought about not only the rule and the wealth of Israel, but that Israel became the most politically speaking, the most powerful nation in Mesopotamia at that time, during the time. And this is actually, for the most part, actually even attested to in the archaeological record. This is not just legends. You can actually find archaeological evidence for this, mention of Solomon, mention of things, mention of the Queen of Sheba. These things are not, some people will say, well, this is just a bunch of fiction. No, this actually, there's a lot of archaeological evidence all for this. Solomon will build a great temple, which is actually something that David will want to do. David will want to build a temple to God, a resting place for the Lord. Because actually there'll be a point where King David will say that how can I have this great palace when God is living in a tent? And he'll want to build a palace, but God will tell him, you cannot build a temple, you cannot build a place for me because your hands are covered in blood. You have too much blood on your hands. And it'll be Solomon, his son, who will build the great temple, the great temple in Jerusalem, which will be considered a great wonder. People will come far and wide to see this great temple. Ultimately, though, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who will take over after him, so King David's grandson, is not wise and prudent because Solomon, in order to build the great temple, as well as to do all of his projects and to keep control over the state of Israel, will tax the people very heavily. And as a result, as most of us who don't like paying our taxes, people at that time also didn't like paying their taxes, and they will come to actually to Rehoboam right after Solomon dies and after Rehoboam takes over, his, and they'll ask Rehoboam for a tax break. They'll say, please lower our taxes. And Rehoboam will say, no, I want to increase the glory of my father. I want to outdo my father, and I'm going to actually tax you even more. And as usually happens, is that half the population will actually break into civil war, and you will find the division of the monarchy into two kingdoms, the north and the south. And the north will separate, the south will stay loyal to King David's family, to Rehoboam and also to all of the successors of King David in the south. The South, if you know anything about Israel, if anyone has ever been there, you'll also know that the South is actually very, very rugged. There's a lot of mountains, there's a lot of hills. Jerusalem itself, which is up right there in the center, this is one of the reasons actually that, Ju that David will want to establish Jerusalem as the capital, because before that, for the most part, there was um, Shiloh, which was a major stronghold of Judaism, was pretty much recognized as being the capital, or one of the capitals. Jerusalem will be established right there at the center, very similar, actually, to the reason why also Washington, D.C. was placed where it was in our country. It was right there up at the top of the south and also at the bottom of the north to bring unity. It was one of the reasons, among many. And actually, David will place Jerusalem there and choose Jerusalem there to bring about unity in his kingdom because even at the time of David, there's still a lot of division between the 12 tribes of Israel. So when the, south, the north will separate and the south will stay loyal to David. The north will go with by the name by the will go with a king by the name of Jeroboam. And so these two kingdoms will progressively live side by side for a very long period of time. And they are connected by blood and oftentimes by alliance. But there will still be a lot of hostility between the two, not dissimilar to the hostility that existed, for instance, in our own country during the time of like the Civil War. I mean, not over slavery and things like that. But they will have actually a lot of hostility. The north, for the most part, will be very liberal. Now, this is a generalization, but to just, I'm not really going to go too much into the Jewish history, but to just give an understanding of the Jewish history, because you can't understand the person of Jesus if you don't understand Jewish history. And you can't actually understand the history of the Catholic Church unless you understand Jewish history, because we as Catholics call ourselves Judeo-Christians. You understand the dynamics of the Jewish faith and why the Jewish faith had certain things and why the Jewish faith developed the way it did. If you understand that, then you will actually understand the Catholic Church much better. Because a lot of the same things which are true of ancient Judaism are going to be the same things which are true of the Catholic Church. So during this split, the North will be very liberal. And actually, the North will, for the most part, not really worship God and God alone. They will repeatedly, over and over and over again, the North who had followed Jeroboam, who had left the family of David, because one, they will no longer worship God in Jerusalem. They will worship God at lots, either in Samaria, 
which becomes the new capital of the north, or they'll start worshiping God in all these little hill shrines. But also, alongside all those little hill shrines, they'll start be popping up little shrines to other gods. Because again, to a person who's uneducated, or a person who's not very strong in their faith, they're just like, okay, well, let's, let's placate Yahweh. Let's also placate Baal. Let's also placate, let's, let's pray to Ishtar. Maybe Ishtar will answer our prayers because Yahweh doesn't seem to give me what I want. So I'm going to pray to Ishtar. I'm going to start praying to all these different foreign gods. So in these little temple shrines, you will have progressively for the next several hundred years, temple shrines which are growing up and popping up, which are worshiping lots of different false gods. Because for the most part, what will happen in the north is that the north will worship Yahweh, but they will also become very polytheistic. They'll worship many gods. And that's actually pretty much true in the north. Um, that's why many of the prophets of the north, and if you know the prophets of the north, the prophets who are speaking on behalf of God to the people of the north, they will constantly be talking about idolatry. But see, the prophets in the north are very different than the prophets in the south. Because the prophets in the south are not going to be preaching predominantly about idolatry, because in the south, they still worship God and God alone because they still have the temple in Jerusalem. They have a central unified place where they can worship. And so they will worship God in Jerusalem. But the prophets in the south is that what will happen with this structured, institutionalized religion is that you will have corruption. You'll have corruption with the priests because one of the things actually, if you know what was actually how the temple sacrifice did, one of the reasons you went to the temple was to have your sins forgiven, is to participate in the Passover event oftentimes, or to have different rituals and to get rid of your sins. Um, I was actually talking with a biblical scholar, and he actually said one of the best ways to understand what actually temple sacrifice entailed is it was a big barbecue. <laughs> you would come, you'd bring your meal, you'd bring your, your offering. Certain parts would be given to the priests, certain parts would be given to God to be burnt off, and then you would get to eat the rest. It was one of the few times where you actually ate meat in the ancient world because meat was very expensive. And so oftentimes, actually, even the state itself would sponsor these public rituals. And so one of the draws to the common person for coming is it was one of the few times where you actually got to eat meat. That's why it says, actually, when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem is that he started slaughtering a cow where he started slaughtering an ox pretty much like every four or five steps. Well, that's a lot of oxes. But there's also a lot of people he had to feed. So actually, that's why he also says he gave out a piece of bread, a raisin cake, and a hunk of meat, and everyone went away happy. <laughs> well, that was pretty much what it was. Actually, the temple sacrifice had a huge slaughterhouse, and so actually there's hundreds and thousands of animals who are being slaughtered, and people are coming and eating them. But what will happen is there will be a lot of corruption which is surrounding that. And so actually a lot of the prophets from the south, the prophets from the more institutionalized church, and also what you could even say the prophets who are dealing with corruption, you're going to find people like Micah. You're going to have prophets who are saying, God doesn't want all of your sacrifices. God is tired with the stink of your sacrifices because you are going through the motions. You're going through the motions, you're doing everything by the books, but your hearts are still cold and hard. And it's actually, you'll find in the South, actually a lot more of talk on, especially the prophets, you start talking about the poor, the subjugation of the poor. He said, you offer sacrifices to God, but you step on the widow, you step on the orphan, you step on all these different pe people. So you'll have two different trains of prophetic schools which are going on. Two different, the prophets who are speaking for God in the South and the prophets who are speaking for the people in the North. Does this make sense? Um, because the reality, the cultures, are different. So it's two different messages, both of which could apply to both, but God is speaking to the people in the language and to address the needs of their particular time. Because all of a sudden, when all of the prophets of God in the north are killed, when actually a king by the name of Ahab, who marries a woman from Phoenicia by the name of Jezebel, Jezebel will come in and she will want all of her gods to be worshipped by, by the Jews and by everyone. And she will bring about the worship of Baal, kill all the competition, which is very effective. If you kill all the competition, then you can raise up, which is what Jezebel tries to do. But she has one, per, one prophet who survives. And his name is Elijah. Elijah the prophet, if you read through the book of Kings, you can read about Elijah the prophet and his successor, Elisha. who The prophets also, for the most part, were not nice people. The prophets, for the most part, 
were the ones who were out and, and screaming at people or yelling at people or telling people that you're going to hell. So that kind of that traditional understanding where maybe people have of people like banging, those were the prophets. They were the ones telling your sins are leading you astray. You are going to destruction. And Elijah the prophet was actually probably one of the biggest ones of this because Elijah will get into this conflict where he will basically go to Ahab and he'll say, until you return to Israel, until you return to God, to Yahweh and worship of Yahweh alone, you will have no rain, you will have drought, and your people will die. And he says, until I pray to God, and actually that's what will happen, there will be a famine which will break out and there will be no rain for three years in the north as there's nothing which is also growing. As a result of that, when finally Ahab is brought to his knees and you have this competition between Baal's prophets and the prophet Elijah, Elijah will finally win in that duel when nothing happens and all of a sudden he brings down fire. Elijah will bring down fire and consume the sacrifice, proving that God is the God of Israel. Elijah will then go and kill all 400 of the prophets of Baal. So the prophets are not always the most cheerful of people. <laughs> The prophets are actually not usually even the happiest of people. Actually, if you were a prophet in Israel, it was more likely than not that you were probably going to be killed. Because the prophets were usually, and this is actually an example of this, is the prophet Jeremiah. And if you came to Mass this past weekend, we went through the readings where Jeremiah is telling the people of Israel, Babylon is going to destroy you because you have been unfaithful to God. Now, Jeremiah is preaching in the south. He's preaching in Jerusalem. And people in Jerusalem have not heard that because... There's a certain point where actually, politically speaking, when you look at, this is the nation of Israel, this is the surrounding ones, this is Judah, stayed loyal to David, Israel, which had abandoned the house of David, but were still Jews, worship Yahweh, but many gods. You have Aram on the north, the Phoenicians, and if you know anything about the Phoenicians, they're for the most part sea traders. That's where purple dye comes from, and actually purple dye, they had a mollusk, which they extracted purple dye from, so the Phoenicians become one of the wealthiest traders in the world. We, you can still see the archaeological ref, uh, evidence for that. The Phoenicians are up in the north. This is where Jezebel will come from. You'll have Philistia, which will be along the coast. Eventually, Philistia will be destroyed by David, but there still will be Philistian pockets. Edom, and if you know anything about Edom, Edom, the descendants of Edom are traditionally understood to be the descendants of Esau, or of the brother of Jacob. Then you'll have Moabite, the Moabites. <coughs> So, when you look at these different pockets, this is the surrounding nations, all of which are, for the most part, hostile to the Jews. Hostile, they're not called Jews at this time, they're called Hebrews. So, at this time, they're hostile to the Hebrews, not unlike the surrounding nations even to this day, that are surrounding the state of Israel and are still hostile to the Jews or to the Hebrews. Obviously, you have Egypt down here. What will happen, though, in the year, about the year 650, is you'll have the rise of an, of an empire called the Assyrians. The Assyrians are one of the first persons to make use of the compound bow. So in technology, in terms of technology of weaponry, usually is the advent of various empires. The Assyrians will make use of the compound bow, and actually they'll become very, very successful, and they'll take over, and this will be pretty much where the entirety of their empire will take over, and you'll see that Israel falls right into that. They will actually not take over the state, the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom being more hilly as well as mountainous, much more difficult to take the south. But this north tended to be much more flat. So actually you could steamroll an army across the north, which is actually what will happen. Um, the Assyrians will come about, and that, that's where you will also find the destruction of the state of Israel, the northern kingdom, um, around the year 650. Um, so the next empire to come about, about 50 years later, will be the rise of the Babylonians. Babylonians will make widespread use of siege engines and things like this. Um, They'll be one of the first to really use siege engineering effectively. Um, the Assyrians had used it, but not as effectively as the Babylonians. The Babylonians will come and will make siege against Jerusalem, and their siege engines will eventually be able to topple Jerusalem, where the southern kingdom will therefore fall. And this is what's called, the first is called the Assyrian exile. The second one is called the Babylonian exile. Does this make sense? Now, the common thing that happened when you had a civilization that came through and conquered an area is that what you would have as the conquerors, the conquerors would take the wealthiest people as well as anyone who was a skilled laborer. So anyone who had any type of skill whatsoever, they would take all of those people and they would deport them and bring them back oftentimes to their main cities. 
and they would enslave you. And then you would be a skilled laborer, they would have things like that, and therefore, the, but the people who were poor, or people who had no, sk who had no law skills, they would leave there. And so any, pretty much what will happen during the Assyrian, the first destruction of the northern kingdom, they will take out all of the different wealthy people, they will take out the population, they will plunder the land, and they will only leave the very poor. And then the very poor, left without their priests, left without their leaders, left without their king, and left without their military, the poor, what will actually happen is that the surrounding tribes will come in and will start moving into the land, and those poor people in the north will actually start intermingling and intermarrying with all of the nations. And so from the perspective of the people in the south, in Judah, is that what these people do is that not only have they abandoned God and David, the house of David, a long time ago, but now they've actually even intermarried and they've lost their Jewish identity. And so these half-breeds, what will actually come about, you'll have this half-breeds of people. You'll have this half-breeds, and these half-breeds who are considered to be, again, not full Jews, actually they're considered half-Jews, but not really even Jews because they don't practice the faith. This is actually what's referred to as the Samaritans. The Samaritans will be this lower echelon of people who are left behind by the Assyrian exile, who had lost their faith, who had intermingled with the nations, and actually they will be despised by anyone who retains their faith. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so in the south, though when they come to the south, because Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, when, if you were actually, and that's what Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah is actually encouraging everyone to surrender, which is why actually the princes will say he is demoralizing everyone. He's encouraging everyone to surrender because Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had a, had a practice that if you surrendered, if you surrendered to the Babylonians, you'd take it, they would leave your civilization intact, you'd be basically a serf, but they will not surrender, and Nebuchadnezzar will come in and will raise the, and burn the city to the ground. Nebuchadnezzar, if you didn't surrender, he would have no uh, mercy on you whatsoever. And that's actually what will happen, because they don't listen to Jeremiah, the city will be burned to the, tap, to the ground, and actually the great temple of Solomon at that time will be destroyed. Also, which is lost during that period, will be the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was lost during that time, and even to this day, there's theories on where it is to this day, but still, we've not recovered, and they've never recovered the Ark of the Covenant, which the Ark of the Covenant, for the Jews, for those of you who don't know it, the Ark of the Covenant was the resting place of God. It's what Moses had been commanded by God in the desert to build this golden box, this golden ark with angels on the top of it that would be carried by poles, and that inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, was the manna, from there was a jar of manna, which the people of Israel had eaten for 40 years, which was proof of God's love for them, proof that he would take care of them. The law, which brought them order, which is very, very important for the Jews, is a law of order. The manna, as well as the priestly staff of Aaron. The priestly staff of Aaron was also placed into that Ark of the Covenant. And all three of these things, which are the three proofs of God's love, was lost during the Babylonian exile. So not only is their civilization destroyed, but actually their religious identity is also completely in danger of becoming annihilated at this time. Because God's proof, which God always left them a physical proof of his covenant with them, is no longer with them. So during the Babylonian exile, you'll find that the Jews who are taken to Babylon, this will be the first time that actually they will be referred to as Jews, is during the time of the Babylonian exile. So during the time of the Babylonian exile, many of those Jews will be brought into exile, and they will ask themselves constantly, why did this happen? And these are people from the south. These are people from the kingdom of David. They will ask themselves, why has this happened? And if you read through the book of Isaiah, you'll find actually that Isaiah is probably three different men who wrote that is that Isaiah will be constantly asking this question of why did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, Isaiah will be dealing with that question over and over again as he's writing through the time of the exile. And that's where the, really the Jewish nation comes together as a people who are in exile, people who are in the diaspora, the dispersion. And what will happen though is that they will actually retain their Jewish identity. They will continue to celebrate the Passover. They will continue to do these various Jewish, and they will keep their identity intact during that time of exile. Not all of them, some people will lose their faith and lose their identity. But those who remain intact will actually outlive the Babylonians because the Babylonians will eventually be taken over 
by the Medes and the Persians. You can see this is a, an example of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the great wonders of the world at the time. Babylonian Empire, which again stretches across the Middle East, again around the 600 BC, will eventually be taken over by the, what's referred to as the Medes and the Persians. And if you know anything about the Persians, Persians, examples of the Persian kings would have been Darius or Xerxes. If you've, any of you have seen the movie 300, this is the time of Xerxes and things like that. There's actually speculation, although we can't really say, is that Esther would have been possibly in the harem, one of the wives of one of these men. Um, there's no real proof for that, but that's the time where the book of Esther happens, is during this period of time. Um, Esther, who no one knows is a Jew, she's a Jew in hiding, but she still keeps alive her Jewish faith. Her, ultimately, she, because of her beauty, she's married into the harem, and she becomes the favored wife of this man in scripture who they actually can't really identify which of the kings of the Persians it is. But Esther, again, the Jews though will collaborate with the Persians very much and they will have very good relationships with the Persians. Even to the point where finally the Persians will, because of their participation, because they've been good and because they helped them with the Babylonians, actually the Jews will rise to high prominence. You'll have a man by the name of Nehemiah will become the cupbearer or one of the most um, valued servants of the king. And Nehemiah will ask, can I please bring back the remnant of the Jews and bring us back to Israel? And as a favor to one of his, favorite, to one of his friends, they actually he will be allowed to go back, and that's where you'll have the return out of exile, from the Babylonian exile. It's during that time that Nehemiah will go back, you'll have the rebuilding of the wall. As part of that wall, you can still see if you go to Jerusalem today, which is called the Wailing Wall. Um, which is Nehemiah as well, you can see right here. It's right here in the Kidron Valley. You'll see the Temple Mount right up here. So, during the Persian Empire, which goes from about 536 to 336, the Persians will eventually, though, be run out by the Greeks. The Greeks, again, Sparta, Athens, as we all probably know from uh, history. The Greeks, who for the most part, actually under Alexander the Great, will come about and will go on his, on his conquest of pretty much all of the known world at that time. Um, and Alexander the Great will also employ what's called Hellenization, or a, a, um, a, he will, what's it called? Sorry, my brain's a little bit fried right now. He will enact a policy of Hellenization. Hellenization, which is actually that Alexander recognizes, as many of the Greeks recognize, is that all of these different cultures all of these different ideologies, all of these different things that are going on which disunites people is a problem. So he says, if we can have one world government, if we can have one world faith, if we can have one world economy, if we can do all of this, if we can make everyone Greek, then actually we will bring about peace. Is actually process, and so what actually, the process of Hellenization is all of the different con all the different countries which Alexander will go into and conquer, and he will actually conquer all the way up to India. What he will establish in its place, he will not leave behind their cultures. He will actually destroy their cultures. Um, he will allow for some limited things, but actually for the most part, he will start building gymnasiums, which is of a Greek nature. He will start employing the Greek Roman. You have to worship the Greek gods all of these different ways and trying to unite all peoples together because he recognizes that religion, politics, and culture are very, very divisive. He's actually a student of the great philosopher Aristotle. Aristotle was actually Alexander the Great's, one of his tutors. And so Alexander, who's very smart, though, again, eventually he will die. Once he gets, he will get struck by an arrow and he will die young. Um, and once he dies, his kingdom will be separated and will be split into all of his warlords. His warlords will each take one, and they will still continue within those territories the process of Hellenization, which is the stripping down of the culture and the replacing and building it up and turning everyone into a Greek. Um, and actually, it will be very, very successful across the board. There will be one area, though, where it will be disastrous, and that will be in the state of Israel. Because in the state of Israel, where it's fundamental to the people who are there, the returning Jews who come back from Nehemiah and things like that, when the Greeks come in and they conquer Israel and then they start trying to employ and to Hellenize the, the Jews is that the Jews will go into armed revolt, will go into armed conflict. And that's actually, if you look at the book of Maccabees, you open up the Catholic Bible 
and this is a distinction between the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible, is that the Catholic Bible will have what's called the Deuterocanonicals, or some people might call the Apocrypha. So if you look in the book of Maccabees, which is part of the Deuterocanonicals, you'll find the story of what goes on during that time. Because we also see that God's hand is still moving and acting through that time. And that's where you'll find actually the slaughter of many Jews, Jews who refuse to worship the Greek gods, who refuse to give up. They're told that they have to hide their circumcision, which was always circumcision was a sign which you knew the guy was a Jew. So actually some Jews will actually try to be Hellenized. They will try to cover up the mark of their circumcision. They will go to the gymnasium. Then you'll have a man who will stand up, and he's from the hill country. He's up in the hills, and they'll come in, and they'll tell him and his family that they must do this, and he's the leader of the town, and he'll basically say no. He'll kill the messenger, and thus you have the beginning of the Maccabean Revolt. And the Maccabean Revolt you will basically be a guerrilla warfare which will happen for quite a period of time. So if you have, again, during the 300s B.C., Again, the Maccabeans, which will actually be people who are constantly in warfare, constantly fighting battles against the sub-lieutenant who is actually over them from Alexander's empire. Um, you can read about this, and it gets to be very, very vicious. I mean, even to the point where actually, but the Maccabeans are actually very, very successful at various periods. There's actually one point where the Maccabeans will be so successful they will drive the Greeks out. They will recreate actually an independent Jewish nation run by the Maccabeans. And actually, they will go into all those places which had been traditionally Jewish at any time, not just like in the last hundred years, but all the way back to King David. And they will basically claim all the territory going back to King David. And they will actually go into places, and they will actually start employing forced conversions back to Judaism. They will actually be forced, uh, forced circumcisions of, ma of young males who traditionally should have been raised Jews, and they'll say, well, these are now Jews and they will actually kill even some of their parents and things like that. You'll have forced conversion. So it's a very bloody time of warfare. And actually, the people who actually, they will actually convert, some of those forced conversions will actually be where a man later rises out. Um, people who, see, even when they had the forced conversions, there's still the Jews who will say, well, these people were forced. They're not really Jews. Um, should we really trust them? King Herod is one of them. That's who King Herod, that's King Herod comes from, this, these people who had been forced into Judaism. And actually, that's where you'll find the rise of King Herod's family. That's also why Herod's family will be such a point of contention for traditional religious Jews who will not really consider Herod to be a full Jew. If you go into the scriptures and trying to understand who King Herod is. Does this make sense? So, again, Alexander's... Empire will be the greatest empire at, the, at that time, which will stretch all the way into India, going across Mesopotamia, all the way into parts of Africa. Again, <coughs> eventually, the Greeks will lose power, obviously, to the Romans. And so the Romans, again, anyone who's seen any of the gladiator films or anything like this knows who the Romans were. The Romans were known for various things, but probably the thing which the Romans are known for the most and why the Rome is, every different civilization has something new to offer, which is one of the reasons why. So the Assyrians had a compound bow. The Babylonians had access to siege engines. The culture as well as the education of the Greek enabled them to have such success. The Romans are going to have much of their success due to, one, to law, to law and order, and two, to roads. Roads, which the Romans were great road builders, and so therefore their ability to move massive amounts of people very quickly. So their ability to build roads as well as that, but they will actually adopt the exact opposite policy of Hellenization. They will look at the mistakes of the Greeks and realize that Hellenization is not a good plan. Hellenization has caused so much bloodshed, it's caused so many problems, it's caused so many constant revolts in those places where they've tried to strip out people of their culture, because it won't be just the Jews who will revolt against Hellenization, it'll be other cultures as well. And so the Romans will actually employ the policy of that if, as long as you pay taxes, if we, they come in and they conquer, as long as you pay taxes, you can keep your identity. You can even be ruled by who you want. As long as you pay lip service and pay taxes to Rome, you can do whatever you want. You have to abide, though, by Roman law. Roman law unites the empire. It's no longer going to be culture which unites the empire, it will be Roman law. So as long as you follow Roman law, you're fine. As long as you pay the taxes, you're fine. You can be, you can be ruled by who you want. 
And actually, the Romans will prop up governments, which is actually ruled by oftentimes those people. This is actually where they will prop up Herod's family because Herod's uh, grand grand or grandfather will actually go and appeal to Rome. Rome will come back and will create what's called the Hasmonean dynasty, or will be Herod the Great's dynasty. Herod the Great will go back to the Hasmoneans, which is the Maccabeans, but there'll be a lot of conflict between the two because Pompey will come into Jerusalem 63 and will bring the end of the Jewish independence. Pompey, who you can, again, obviously had uh, dealings with Caesar. Caesar will, Julius Caesar will defeat Pompey in 45. Therefore, after, during 40, Herod the Great will be installed as the king of the Jews in Rome in 40 BC. And Herod the Great, for the most part, doesn't seem to really actually be a particularly religious man. He uses religion as a means of controlling the population. He will be, though, he will be very, very smart. He is actually a master builder. He's a master politician. And he's very good in keeping, actually, all of the different competing peoples at his time in check. And he will do it brutally at times. But Herod the Great, politically speaking, as well as uh, economically speaking, will actually bring about a reflourishing of the state of Israel. Pe the people who are religiously minded don't particularly like him because they see him as one, allied with Rome, as well as being a puppet of Rome and that they don't really see him as being particularly faithful to the Jewish religion, which, again, being of, this, of these um, people who have been forced into conversion, there will even be questions of, is he really a Jew at all? So, Herod the Great will be very, very brutal. Obviously, if you know the story of Jesus, you know that when Jesus was predicted, he will also become very, very paranoid because everyone will try to topple Herod. Actually, his own sons... Constantly, he will have to murder, he will have to kill two of his own sons because they rebel against him. He will kill his favorite wife because she gets angry with him and tries to have him killed. Um, when you actually go through all the different people that King Herod will kill in his own family to keep himself alive, I don't think that actually Herod necessarily wanted to kill them, but he is very, very, very efficient, which is actually one of the reasons why he's a king and why Rome wanted him there because he was very efficient in keeping peace in a very hot political bed where there's lots of different competing um, peoples. So, Herod, again, the Roman Empire, which will stretch over the entirety of the Middle East as well as Europe and into northern Africa. <clears throat> there will be main, two different main political, there will be one main political body of Jews who for the most part runs Israel. And this is called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin will run the state of Israel and the Sanhedrin will be composed of, for the most part, two different bodies of people, two different groupings of people. And this two groupings of people is called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And these two groups who were forced, basically, by, if they wanted, they had to get along. Is that they had to get along to get things done. They had to be, but they did not like each other. The Pharisees, again, this is the limiting self-ruling body. The Pharisees will be for the most part, people who, on the surface level, you really can't tell apart because they're both going to worship in the temple. They're both going to be concerned with the religious practices. But when you look at them, the Pharisees are going to be much more aligned to the traditional Jewish identity. This identity of going back to the Maccabees, the Pharisees will be, for the most part, they are not pro-Rome, um, they're anti-Rome, versus the Sadducees who will be pro-Rome. They are going to be kind of the political puppets of the Romans, where that's what they'll be accused of. The Sadducees will also be in, in alignment, and they will be closely allied with King Herod, will be the priests who are actually ruling in the temple. So the Sadducees are actually, if you want to understand what a Sadducee is, a Sadducee is a priest. A Pharisee is not a priest. So the priests of the day who were actually, this is in the state of Israel, in the way in which you can understand it best, it's more of a theocracy than anything else. So it's the priests who actually rule the state of Israel, the priests who do everything, the priests who are the intellectual elite, the economic elite, as well as the religious elite. And the priests are going to be the Sadducees, but the Sadducees had to get along with their rivals, which is the Pharisees. Now, actually, even within the party of the Sadducees, you will have guys who are religious and guys who actually are faithful, but they will actually be shunted aside. Anyone who is actually kind of pro-Jew, pro-religion, pro-things like that. For the most part, actually, even though they're the priests, they're going to, for the most part, be very, very secular and very, very corrupt, the Sadducees. There are faithful Sadducees, 
but they get shunted off and they actually go off and live in the desert and these are called the Aseans. So actually because you'll have a split in the Sadducees party between those, the Aseans will go off and they will talk about spiritual renewal, we'll talk about things like that, but they are the Sadducees who are basically shunted out. The Pharisees on the other hand though, during the time of the Babylonian exile, you're going to have these little rises of pocket communities of Jews. And so you're going to have these independent groupings of Jews who are going to gather together, and they're going to gather together under a leader. These leaders are oftentimes going to be called rabbis. Rabbis are not actually traditionally. Rabbi also means teacher. So these teachers of the law, these people who keep the Jewish faith alive during the Babylonian exile, you're going to really see that these are going to be the, where the Pharisees kind of evolve out of. The Pharisees, for the most part, are not going to be the intellectual elite, which is going to be the Sadducees, but they are going to be highly intellectual, highly trained. They're going to have a lot of education. They're going to be a lot of the people who are going to be anti-Rome, but they're also going to be very reasonable. They're not going to necessarily want to antagonize Rome. They'll want to coexist and co-mingle with Rome as long as Rome doesn't start invading in, into their territory, into religious sphere. Uh, so you're going to find that the Pharisees, for the most part, will be pro-state of Israel versus the Sadducees will be pro-Rome. You'll find that the Pharisees, for the most part, are going to be worshiping, and most of their services, most of things like this, a lot of their emphasis will be placed around, at times, going to the temple when they have to, but there will also be a lot of things going on in synagogues, their local gathering areas, versus the Sadducees, who all of their focus and all their direction is all ordered towards the temple worship, because Herod will build a new temple. And so the Sadducees will be in charge of maintaining the temple, keeping up the temple, as well as making sure that monies taxes are flowing into the temple. Um, this is also going to be why John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, who is in this, um, of this, probably this class, that's why he's in the temple sacrificing. That's also why John the Baptist later on will be off with, his, with the Essenes. That's where he comes from, is the Essenes, the more spiritual of the Sadducees who get shunted off into the desert. And that's where you're going to find a major area of Essenes, of these, of these spiritual Sadducees, will be in the area of what's called Qumran, or by the Dead Sea. It'll be the dead, that's also where the Dead Sea Scrolls will come from. So, another spiritual dimension, a difference between them, though, in terms of their theology, which will make a major, major, major distinction, is that the Pharisees, being actually much more religious, and actually the Pharisees, we sometimes get a bad rep as being kind of anti-Jew and killing the Jesus, I mean, anti-Jesus and killing Jesus and things like this. For the most part, the Pharisees are the moderates of their day. The Pharisees are the moderates, and they're actually, for the most part, very faithful Jews. They believe in all the different history of the Jews. They believe in the resurrection. This is actually a fundamental part of the Pharisees' belief. They believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection of the body. They don't believe in the resurrection at all. They believe that when you die, you're dead, um, which doesn't make a lot of sense for why they're in charge of the temple. I don't know why. <laughs> But still, it's a very different, when you're talking about Jewish priests, it's very different than the understanding even of our priests today. This is the reality of what's going on at the time of Christ. So, the Pharisees are also very much interested in looking forward to the Messiah, who's going to come. The Sadducees don't like Messiahs. They're very content with the status quo. They're very content with keeping things the way it is. They're very content with keeping their money in the temple, making sure that they're making their profit, making sure that, that all the things are taken. And they don't really, are not particularly um, focused on spiritual renewal. The Pharisees will very, very much be focused upon spiritual renewal, but they're also concerned with political renewal versus the Sadducees are not concerned with, really with political renewal because they're politically corrupt. <clears throat> also, when you look at the, their belief in the scriptures and their belief in the Old Testament, the Sadducees, see, as soon as you start reading the books of the prophets, the prophets, well, the Sadducees are not going to really like the prophets because people like Micah or people who are starting to criticize especially the temple, the prophetic tradition is actually going to be highly, highly aggressive towards the Sadducees and they're not going to like it. So actually the Sadducees will not accept anything in the Old Testament except the five books of Moses, the Torah. The Sadducees will basically only accept the Torah. They will not accept anything outside of the Torah. They will not take into account anything of what's called the writings or any of the um, prophets. They will deny that this is the word of God. They'll say this is not the word of God. The word of God is only the law. Versus the Sadducees, they will actually accept not only the five books of the law, the five books of Moses, the Torah, 
the first five books of the Bible, but they will also accept all of the prophets and they'll accept the writings. So actually when you look at what the Pharisees actually accepted at their time, they will accept what is classically understood to be the Catholic Old Testament. And actually the reason why they will do, they, I say this, the Catholic Old Testament, because again, going back to that understanding of what was actually being used commonly, is that during the time of the Greeks, the Greek emperor, one of the Greek emperors, I forget his name, asked the Jews in the diaspora, asked the Jews who had been separated, and they asked their leaders, can you please, for the Library of Alexandria, compile your different holy writings and put them into Greek? So actually there will be 70 rabbis, or 72 rabbis, who will meet together, and they will meet together and they will actually compile this book of what's called the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament, all the, all the books which they consider to be the Word of God. And they will compile into the Septuagint this, and that's why it's called the 70, because it's about the 70 rabbis who bring them together. They will translate it. Again, there's legends which go along with the Septuagint. I'm not going to get into that so much. But the Septuagint will be written in about in the 300s, and the Septuagint will be used actually by the Pharisees extensively as both by many common people. And we know for a fact that St. Paul used the Septuagint and that he considered it to be the Word of God because he preaches and quotes directly from the Septuagint. So this Septuagint, which actually had the writings, the prophets, as well as the Torah, will actually be kind of the main way in which what the Pharisees will consider to be the Word of God. Does this make sense? So, so current day Jewish are more like Sadducees in terms of what they current day, use, use the current day Jews are going to actually be an evolution out of the Pharisees. So you can't really say they're Sadducees because they're not really Sadducees. They'll be, but current day Judaism is not really unified as one centralized religion anymore, if that makes sense. Because you have conservatives, you have orthodox, you have uh, reforms. So, and all of them have different positions and different things on what it means to be a Jew. No, they do actually. They have the. It depends on which. It depends on what you're dealing with. Because um, they're. You don't have it. It's not like the Pope, who unifies all of us. So you don't have one central Jewish leader. So depending on which branch of Judaism you follow, depends on what you kind of accept as being the word of God. All Jews will accept the Torah. But there are what's referred to as the writings as well as the prophets, which are kind of, but that's why actually the, uh, the Torah is, uh, you have uh, mitzvah, which is kind of their commentaries. You have the Torah, and then you have the actual Old Testament, which they also have. You had a question? Was Caiaphas a uh, Sadducee? Caiaphas was a Sadducee. So was Ananias. His father-in-law, both were Sadducees. The ones who actually killed Jesus, the ones who were prime up, and it's actually, if you read in the Gospel, it comes in the Gospel of Mark, which in terms of the linearity probably happened. As soon as Jesus goes into the temple and causes problems in the temple, this is the moment that the Sadducees decide that he has to die, which actually makes sense. As long as he's out in the countryside, as long as he's doing it, they don't like him. But as soon as they, he comes in and messes up and starts messing with their business, that's when it's decided that, no, this man is, has to die. He starts flipping over tables and casting people out and whipping people out the Sadducees will have no tolerance for this whatsoever. And then when he starts telling about the destruction that he's going to destroy the temple, the Sadducees, this is the point where actually that's where it says it's better for one man to die than for the state of Israel to be destroyed. And that's where Caiaphas, it won't, but it won't be actually the Pharisees. During the trial of Jesus, for the most part, a lot of the Pharisees, they happened in the middle of the night. A lot of the Pharisees were not gathered because if they had gathered the full Sanhedrin, Jesus would not have been condemned because it was predominantly actually being led by the Sadducees, and it was the Sadducees who were going after Jesus. Um, a lot of the Pharisees actually objected to the trial of Jesus and then recused themselves and, and removed themselves. Um, there'll be a, probably, there will be a few Pharisees who will go after Jesus, um, but for the most part, actually, the people who are following Jesus, the ones who like Jesus are the Pharisees. The one reason why Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and criticizing the Pharisees over and over again is because they're the, actually the ones who are following him. Because Jesus has no problem criticizing his followers. The Sadducees, he never criticizes the Sadducees because they're never around him because they have, want nothing to do with him. If that makes sense. Because the Pharisees are looking at Jesus with hope that he is possibly the Messiah. The Sadducees are not. Um, the, the Sadducees don't want a Messiah. They're content with everything. They, they say that everything has happened. They say that what is happening is right. Then you have 
your right wingers, mm -hmm. the ones who want the state of Israel now, we're going to do this by violence. And this is what's referred to as the zealot class, where again, zealot is more of a grouping of people. They're going to be the ones who are far, far to the right. They want to destroy Rome. They want Rome out. They want to reestablish a Maccabean kingdom. Rome came in, destroyed it. They want it now. The Pharisees, like I said, are going to be much more moderate. The Pharisees don't want to cause problems with Rome. Again, kind of the Jewish understanding of that time by many people would be, you know what, we've survived the Greeks, we survived the Babylonians, we've survived, we hunker down, we go into eternal shell mode, and eventually Rome will disappear. But the Zealots are not content for that. They want it now. And so the Zealots, who are willing to go into armed revolt, and this is also the Zealots will constantly be causing problems for the Romans. This is why the Romans will constantly be there. If you got sent to be the, um, what Pilate will have as the job in Rome, the governor of Judea, is that this was considered to be actually a punishment. Is that this was not actually a good post that you got. No one wanted to go to Judah because one, it was hot, it was miserable, and you were constantly in danger of assassination, and you couldn't get any of these people to work together <laughs> because all of them had competing ideologies, if that makes sense. And so the zealots, though, are going to be the ones who are causing most of the problems. They're the ones who are going to be the violent. They want Israel now through any means, and that's, they're going to do it through revolution. And so Rome will have a very efficient way of dealing with revolutionaries. They will crucify them, which was the worst possible way that you could die. And they design it specifically. They want crucifixion because it was meant to scare the bejeebas out of anyone who watched it. Because you saw a person dying on a cross, and you didn't want to go through that which is why they will use crucifixion. Rome will not kill their own citizens by crucifixion. They will consider this to be something which is only for revolutionaries who are non-Romans. Revolutionaries who are Romans will actually get beheaded. The cause of death of actually if you were a Roman citizen was to be beheaded. If you were not a Roman citizen, though, you, and you were deemed to be a revolutionary, you would be crucified. So the Rome would also kill you in lots of different ways. They'd flay you alive. They'd burn you, they do lots of different things. But they're worst of the worst possible way of getting rid of things. And actually the one thing which Rome had no tolerance for was revolt against Roman law. If that makes sense. So the Pharisees will be sympathetic towards the zealots, but not necessarily support them. The Sadducees will hate the zealot class. This is also admittedly what actually the Sadducees will come and basically be accusing Jesus of of being a member of this class. That's, and Pilate will not believe it. Pilate will go through it and actually will, will recognize that this is a setup. But that's basically what they're accusing Jesus of being is a, uh, basically a member who's trying to start an armed revolt. He's talking about the destruction and they use all these different terms and they manipulate the data and ma manipulate things to try to help them. Rome will not tolerate this whatsoever though. Which is also why the accusation against Jesus is when actually the Sadducees will start screaming at Pilate if you do not kill this revolutionary, you are no friend of Caesar. What they're threatening to do is to report, and Caesar also had no tolerance for this, and Pilate was not particularly liked, which is why, one of the reasons why he's there. So if Pilate lost control of Judea, Pilate's head was, on a, was going to be on a plate. <laughs> so when the Sadducees start basically forcing Pilate to kill Jesus by this cause that we're going to report you to Rome, and it was very common. Actually, Herod got brought, Herod multiple times got brought to Rome because of accusations of being unjust and of breaking Roman law. So, because the Romans were very hard on any administrator who, who took advantage of the population and caused revolts. As long as you, you could tax them, but don't tax them too much or they revolt, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So, then you have these people who've gone off into the desert, the main other, another main um, grouping of Jews of the time would be, again, these Essenes, who were really, for the most part, from the Sadducees class. These are the spiritualists of the Sadducees, the ones who have been forced out. They reject the priesthood of the ruling body um, in Israel, and they go off into the desert. And these are the ones who are preaching spiritual renewal. And they are looking forward to, actually, the Messiah. But the Essenes' expectations of the Messiah the Pharisees will expect a physical, political Messiah. The Essenes, for the most part, will not. The Essenes will actually be much more of what's referred to as a spiritualists. They talk about a spiritual renewal. They talk about a spiritual kingdom. They talk about spiritual things. Um, they will accept the Torah. Um, they will accept also spiritual writings and things like that. But for the most part, the Essenes are talking about spiritual renewal. 
And this is actually the grouping that John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, will come from. Um, so actually, being the cousin of Jesus, Jesus has some type of connection somehow to those early bodies, but Jesus, for the most part, has no particular... Um, Jesus would not have been a priest. <clears throat> the Pharisees will find the Essenes Asse appealing in terms of their spiritual dimensions. Um, they'll basically be the, Fer the Sadducees that they can get along with. But these people have been ousted. So... The Sadducees will find the Essenes irrelevant and likewise not very happy. They don't particularly like them, but as long as they stay off in the desert and they don't get involved in the political process of what's going on in Jerusalem, they don't really care. <laughs> so, Jesus of Nazareth, when Jesus comes into the world, obviously as Christians, we believe that Jesus, again, if you read the Gospel of Luke, you see, again, the Annunciation. Jesus, again, comes into the world. God becomes man, takes on human flesh. A few indisputable facts about Jesus. There's no real serious scholar today who, dis who disbates the historicity of Jesus the man. Uh, there's a lot of facts, obviously, and there's a lot of things about Jesus that people will obviously have opinions on, and that people will debate, and people will um, say that this didn't happen, or this didn't happen, this was exaggerated by Christians, this, so, so forth and so on. There's a numerous debates on Jesus and actually what he actually said. I don't know if you know this, Thomas Jefferson actually went through a Bible and cut out the actual phrases of Jesus, and that's all that he would actually look at, because he didn't want anyone, anything other than Jesus' actual things influencing him. Not that even Jefferson really even believed that Jesus was the Son of God, because he was a deist. He believed that God created the world, and then kind of like a clock, he spent it off and left it. But no serious scholar really debates the historicity of Jesus. Jesus is attested to by the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century. Again, the Roman historian Tactus also refers to Christus, to Jesus, as being a historical figure, and also have his followers. Usually, actually, in, in the early Christian period, if you were referred to as a, as a follower of Christus, it usually meant that there was problems happening because Christians in the early church, or in the early periods, were always surrounded around controversy because there was always big, huge fights which were blowing up. Oftentimes, that ended up bloody. <laughs> and so Rome, which had no tolerance for any type of rebellion or any type of infighting, would come down hard on the Christians. But... Jesus, direct apostles, and obviously Jesus' own disciples will also attest to the historicity of the man. So three different sources which look at Jesus. Again, the 12 apostles will be primary figures in the early church, um, all of whom you can find. So the undisputed historical facts which are agreed upon by both Christians and by non-Christians are the birth, that Jesus was born um, at some point between... Um, zero, or between whatever you want to call it, but I, I still will call it A.D. and B.C. So Jesus was probably born around the year 3, 3 A.D., 0 to 3 A.D. His birth, his baptism by John, is another undisputed historical fact that no one really um, disputes. And the reason for the, the baptism by John as being a histor historical fact that no one disputes is that this has caused numerous theological problems for Christians of why Jesus was baptized. We'll get into some of that um, later, but Jesus' baptism by John is something that everyone recognizes because it has caused so many problems for Christians that Christians would have liked to possibly have swept this under the carpet, would have liked to have ignored this because it causes a lot of problems, and that very fact actually proves to its actual historicity in terms of things that no one really disputes in terms of Jesus' actual what happened in his life. A lot of people will dispute parables, they'll dispute sayings, they'll dispute actual events, but that's one that no one really disputes, is the baptism by John, because it's caused so many different problems. Also, his ministry in Galilee, which is the surrounding area around Jerusalem, as well as the condemnation to death by the Roman governor Pilate. Because and one of the reasons that I say this is that the Jews did not have the authority. They had their authority to do almost everything in terms of ruling the state of Israel, but they did not have the authority of capital punishment. The Romans had regulated that, that to themselves. You had to go to the Romans if you wanted a capital punishment case. And the Romans would then kill you because this fell within Roman territory and Roman law. So the condemnation to death by the Roman governor Pilate, another undisputed historical fact, and also his crucifixion. It's another thing which is an undisputed historical fact. Now, and his death. The disputed <laughs> historical facts, debated historical facts, but I would also say that there are facts. Obviously, you're in a Catholic church, so you're going to get some of this. His actual teachings, 
which you can find in the scriptures, the concrete dates. Again, the dates are hard to pin down because they didn't have the same um, history, uh, timing of history and things like that. It's not like they had A.D. or B.C.E. or things like that. Basically, all the dates at that time, for the most part, were chronologized by in the year of this Roman governor, so forth and so on. That's why, actually, that's how it even says in the Gospel, I believe, of uh, Luke. It says in the year of this Roman governor that this happened. So the concrete dates are always, again, disputed. Jesus' personal life and upbringing, actually, there's a period of about 30 of... Um, I mean, Jesus, is, for the most part, his entire youth, as well as his early adulthood, is all things which we really don't know very much about. There's different writings which have been written on him, and actually some very early writings. We know from the Gospel of Luke about his birth and up to about the age of two. We know about one account where he was about 12 years old. And then for the most part, any, everything else other than that, we don't really know very much about. It's also what's referred to as the hidden years. So you ever hear that term, the hidden years? This is those years where we really don't have anything from the scriptures writing about it. There are a couple of other early documents which do talk about it, but the early church did not deem that these were, we, they couldn't verify whether or not these were true, and therefore they didn't make it in the Bible. So there are certain legends, there are certain stories which come about. There's one which is called the Proto-Evangelium of James. Proto-Evangelium of James, or also called the, Gospel of, the Proto-Gospel of James, has some of those early stories where you get some of like the legends and the stories of like Anna and Joachim, or you have Mary being a temple virgin, or things like this. Um, but those things were not deemed as being, um, they didn't have the merits that other books did, and they didn't make it in the Bible. So the personal life, obviously his origin is a b- big disputed fact, but again, did Jesus, was he just a man, or was he actually God? Um, or was he a blend of the two? Again, was he, again, the Trinity, the, def- the doctrine of the Trinity, the dogma of the Trinity, what was actually where he came from, or did he just come from the man Joseph and his wife Mary? Um, also, his resurrection from the dead, obviously things which are debated, and then the ascension into heaven. All of these things, obviously, the Catholic Church and Christians have very strong opinions on, and we all believe there are certain things. But just kind of looking at the difference about what is actually agreed upon even by secular people versus the things which are not agreed upon in terms of, at least as, since this is a history course. So, when you look at Jesus, because we're not going to, so, we're focusing again, this is kind of prepping up for the next um, few courses. This is not really a course on Jesus. This is not a course on Christology. This is not a, a course on Scripture, what Jesus said, and things like this. This is, again, a course on the early church. And, but to understand the early church, you have to understand, I, that's why I kind of go into the Jewish history, because now we can get into the early church. As Jesus establishes his church, on apostles. And you can see this very clearly from Matthew 16, that Jesus chooses Simon Peter as the head of the 12. And he chooses them, he chooses these 12 specifically because he is building a new tribes of Israel, which are built upon the old. So the 12 apostles will now be symbolic representatives as well as real pillars of the new church. They will be seen as the new 12 tribes of Israel. And so anyone who can trace themselves back to an apostle can trace himself in the ap- apostolicity, the understanding of an apostle is very, very important because in the early church, as well as, again, immediately following Jesus' death, you have lots of people who are talking about Jesus and lots of people who are proclaiming that they are speaking on behalf of Jesus. But then the question becomes, there are many people who also are starting to contradict each other. And this is happening almost immediately after Jesus is gone. People are already starting to contradict And so that's why, actually, in the early church, one of the ways in which they verified is how do we know to trust you? Because, actually, the Greeks will also start hearing about this Christus, and they will start actually liking some of the messages. And one of the groups that actually will like it is what a group called the Sophists, also a group of people called the Gnostics. The Sophists Sophists was a philosophy where you took anything that you liked and you kind of just adapted it and you you eliminated the pieces you didn't like. It's called sophistry. So we still have we still have lots of sophists in the world today, <laughs> okay. And then you had Gnostics, Gnostics who were these spiritualists, spiritualist Greeks, who had who were not though Christians. And you'll have actually a lot of Gnostics will start looking at the gospel and they will just start reinterpreting it. This is actually one of the reasons why Saint John the Apostle will write his gospel, because people, especially Gnostic leaning Jews or Gnostic leaning um, Christians who have come over, will start perverting and distorting the gospel. And John will actually write his gospel directly in opposition 
to these Gnostics who are writing and actually perverting the gospel. That's why he wrote his gospel. Um, you can see it very clearly. So in the early church, one of the ways in which you evaluated, how do we know what is the actual teachings of Christ? Because we don't have Jesus Christ in front of us, at least by perception. We don't have him. We can't ask him what is his actual teachings. All that we have is his message, which is coming to us through human beings. So one of the ways in which they verified, and we have documents, the letter of Clement, which is, again, documented to about the 100. You have the letters of Barnabas. You have lots of different letters, letters of Ignatius, of Antioch. A lot of these, are what these early church writers will actually all talk about the same thing. You must be able to trace yourself back to one of Jesus' direct apostles that he entrusted the gospel to. Very simply. That's how you know. In all of these different competing gospels, all these different, because you also have four gospels, you have lots of different gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're not all exactly the same. But then you also have like gospels like the Gospel of Judas, you have the Gospel, all these, the Gospel of the Evangelium, you have all these different writings. You have another document called the Didache, which is actually called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. And there was actually in the early church, there was a, or it actually was very popular at the time, not just in the church, but in other things, is that you would actually have pen writers. People who would actually write something on behalf of someone else, and then you'd stamp that person's name on it. And this actually becomes very, very common, is that people will start writing people's, writing Gospels, and then they will stamp a person's name on it. Well, we probably know that Matthew, the Gospel writer, probably didn't write his actual Gospel. He probably had someone writing it for him. Or there was a person from his community who had heard it, who had transcribed and wrote it down. Was it Matthew who actually wrote it? Probably not. The same thing is possibly true of, of Mark and Luke. The only Gospel that actually were the most sure was actually written by one of the actual apostles, if any, was the Gospel of John. John is probably the most sure that we was actually written by John himself because it's so weird. <laughs> <coughs> but the other Gospels are, again, so, but it was very common you just stamped an apostle's name on it to give it authority, to give it credit, to connect it back to Jesus himself. And so that's, but there's also going to be people who are writing Gospels who are going to stamp names onto those books of different people who everyone knew was a follower of Christ, but those people went to far off land, so how are they going to verify it? such as the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas was not written by the Apostle Thomas because we know Thomas went to India and we know where Tom, the Gospel of Thomas originated from and it was not in India. It was a person who wrote it and actually to try to give his Gospel, his, or as the early church would say, his perversion of the Gospel, more credit and more authority, they just stamped the name of an Apostle because that's why apostolicity is so important actually in the early church and why all you have all these different names because it was a way in which they verified an actual teaching of Jesus. Does this make sense? So, Simon Peter, we'll go for about 10 more minutes and then we'll, we'll call it for the night. Simon Peter, also called um, Cephas, not Cephas, which is country fried steak, but Cephas, <laughs> again, the boasting fisherman. Again, we know that, again, Jesus in Matthew 16 gives him the keys of the kingdom that Jesus establishes. He says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He doesn't make Peter a king, he makes him the steward, which actually, if you want to know what the steward's role is and things of this nature, you can go back to the book of Leviticus and you can see more fully because Jesus actually references in various elements actually that, prophetic, that priestly office as found in Leviticus. It was always understood that the steward was the one who actually had the power of keys, the power of binding and loosening, of opening doors or closing doors. That's why you had keys and that's why he says to the, that's why he gives him the keys as well as that Peter will be recognized as the leader of the Twelve. Peter will eventually be in Jerusalem. He will then end up in Antioch. And actually, the churches in Antioch, which is in part of Turkey, is that the Melkite as well as the Syriac right, the Syriac churches, can still trace themselves back to this today. And actually, the Melkite and the Syriac rites of, or the churches, are actually what we refer to as apostolic churches. And they have apostolic authority because they were founded by Peter. Peter will obviously eventually end up in Rome, where he actually, with St. Paul, will establish the church in Rome. This will be his final resting place. This is where he will finally, eventually die as he's crucified. And this is where the Catholic Church traces itself back to, in terms of an apostle that we trace ourselves to. Because when you look to Rome, we know that he went to Rome eventually. He was dragged there and taken there. And that's where he would eventually be um, executed in the reign of King Nero, or of Emperor Nero. Um, where he will be, according to tradition that we have, he's crucified upside down. And actually, even to this day, we have his relics, we have his bones, which are actually in a little small church at the bottom of St. Peter's Basilica. 
and you can actually go there. You have to have about a six-month reservation to get in to see it, but it's called the Scavi Tour. You can actually go and, and see it. Um, seminarians oftentimes are the ones who go and, and you uh, can do a Scavi Tour and you can see it. And we know this because ever since the beginning, one of the ways they would always keep the remains, just like we keep our beloved remains, the early church did the same thing. They'd keep the remains of their beloved dead, and they will actually end up coming and praying at those tombs. And thus you'll have to actually the beginning was referred to as the veneration of relics in the church. Because people will then start coming to pray around those tombs, and therefore they will pray around the tomb of Peter. That's how we know, because we found a box which said this is the, of the fishermen. And inside was actually a man who they can, they've done a bunch of dating on those bones. It goes back to a man from Galilee who somehow his bones end up in Rome, and that, his hands, that the hands are actually hacked off. Because the more common practice when you were crucified, which isn't how we know that Peter was crucified, is that you wouldn't pull the nails out. You just, the soldiers would just hack your hands off, hack your feet off, and they'd take the corpse off the cross. Which is actually the very fact that Jesus was taken down off the cross, and probably the reason from a historical perspective for why Jesus' hands and feet are not hacked off by the Romans is because his mother is right there. His mother is right there, and they probably had mercy on her, which is the reason, again, from a practical standpoint, for why don't the Jews do that to them. Because one, it's predicted that not a bone of his body will be broken. But then two, again, Mary's right there. He has his family right there. Most of the time when you had a crucifixion, the family was nowhere to be found. And the Romans, again, at least we know that one of the Romans, a man by the name of Longulus, had mercy and realized that this was wrong. That's where you find in Luke's gospel that it will be um, most likely the man Longulus who will say, Behold, I truly this man was the Son of God. Um, but Peter, well, <laughs> Peter will not be so lucky. <laughs> Peter will go through a traditional crucifixion, although he will say, I can't, I'm not worthy to die the way that my Lord did, and so the Romans will crucify him upside down. He'll be hacked off. We still have his bones to this day. And this is where he's actually... Before that, though, Peter still always has a struggle with his faith and a struggle with doing the right thing because during the time of Nero, Peter will try to be escaping from the city because he doesn't want to die. Because ever, actually, usually when it came to suffering, if you read the scriptures, you'll realize that Peter didn't want to suffer. This is Peter's big cross in his life is the call to suffering. And Peter tried, at, usually at actually every conflict, to usually avoid suffering. And we know that he took the cheap and easy way out very frequently because he did it in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did it at the trial of Jesus where he took the easy way out. Well, he tried to do the right thing. When it really came down the line, Peter always ran away. We also see that Peter will have conflicts later on when he's called to stand up and do the right thing in the community and lead the community, and he will go with the crowd. And St. Paul will actually come up and he will call him to his face that you're a hypocrite, to his face that he'll say this. And then finally, when he's finally in Rome, when all of a sudden a persecution breaks out after Nero burns the city of the poor parts of Rome to the ground because he wants to rebuild Rome, but he has to burn down the old one. Well, that's not going to be very popular with the people who are living there. So he burns down the city of Rome and blames it on the Christians, who is this small sect of Jews that no one really likes that becomes his scapegoat. So during that burning of the Rome, after he hit, Peter finds out about it and is booking it out. of, And you can actually still go and walk the Via Pia which is the road where Peter is running out. And as he was running out of Rome, according to our stories, is that Peter actually saw Jesus walking, had a vision of Christ walking back into Rome. And he turned to Jesus and he asked him, Lord, where are you going? He said, what, what's going on? Where are you going? And Jesus says to him, he says, my sheep are without a shepherd. I'm going to be crucified once again and to die with my sheep. And so Peter hangs his head and turns around and walks back to Rome. <laughs> And then finally gives himself and finally understands what it means to live for the sheep. To die for the sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He has to stop living for himself. Peter, though, now that's actually a comforting thought because this is the church upon which we have been built. When you look at actually the apostolic churches, the, apostolic, the largest apostolic church to this day is still the Roman Catholic Church. When people think of the word Catholic, again, this is the church of Peter. This is the head of the apostles. And you can say that Jesus chooses Peter because he chooses the weakest link. Because he's come to save the weakest link. So actually the fact that, Jesus, that Peter, even from the very beginning, you'll find that Peter struggles with his faith and struggles with doing the right thing, and he is the leader of the church. Which if you've struggled with your faith and things like that, then Peter is a good person to look to 
because we also recognize that Peter finally got it right and is a saint. So, Peter, the keys to which he's given, you also have Peter's brother, Andrew, Andrew the fisherman, who probably actually, Andrew, a lot of people speculate that Andrew was actually a disciple of John the Baptist, which is why in one of the Gospels you'll find that, that Andrew will come and find Peter and will bring Jesus, bring Peter to Jesus, and you'll have that encounter where Andrew will bring him. Again, John the Baptist who eventually Jesus will go, and you'll find that account in one of the Gospels as well. It says that two of the disciples of John the Baptist, as Jesus was went, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes, behold him. Two of them will walk away. Supposedly one of them was Andrew. Andrew will go and find his brother Peter and say, Look and come and find, I found the Messiah. And Peter will come. So Andrew, being a disciple of John the Baptist, Andrew will actually end up in Greece and will do most of his ministry of preaching the gospel and preaching the church and preaching this he will eventually be crucified on an X-shaped cross. So if you ever see an X-shaped cross, a guy on it, that's St. Andrew. St. Andrew is actually the founder of what the, we refer to as the Greek Orthodox Church. So if you know any Greek Orthodox, they usually have big black beards and big huge hats. Um, they are also an apostolic church. They can trace themselves all the way back to Andrew, and therefore we know that that gospel, which is contained within the Greek Orthodox Church, is valid and true. Does this make sense? Now, Again, we still have, again, this is in St. Peter's Basilica, it's in Andrew. Recently, there's always been a lot of contention with the Greek Orthodox. We're going to go into a lot of that tension throughout this series of what happened with the Greek Orthodox Church. And even to this day, though, there's a lot of work towards reunification between the Greek Orthodox because we recognize that both of us are real churches. Both of us can trace ourselves back to one of the apostles, and we have been going back to that time even of Jesus. This is not the only apostolic church, though. Again, those are not the only ones. You also have actually James, the older brother of John, also called the son of thunder. We know that he also was a fisherman. And James is the one who actually will turn to Jesus and will say, when they are cast out of a Samaritan town, when they go into Samaria and they're cast out and they're not welcome, James will be the older brother who will say, Lord, let's call down fire from heaven and consume them and burn them alive. Actually, because he's also referring back to kind of this prophetic Elijah type thing, and that's where Jesus will say, no, we're not going to burn them alive. He rebuked them. James, though, again, the ambition, I'd say the fiery older brother, you also see this, uh, is that in one of the Gospels, you'll find that James and John will come and ask, Lord, place me on your right, place me on your left. They'll be seeking glory, seeking this. So you can get a little bit of the persona as well as kind of the personality of James, what he's seeking, what he's longing for, what he's looking for which is not quite what Jesus is preaching about. And James doesn't quite understand that as they're seeking for glory. Eventually, James, though, after the resurrection, James will probably go the farthest. James will end up actually going all the way to Spain. And you can still walk the Via Compostello to this day, a pilgrimage route where you trace the footsteps of St. James going all the way from, Paris or from France into Spain. And the Via Compostello is actually the, one of the oldest as well as the most popular pilgrimage routes for Christians in the world today. Um, Martin Sheen, I believe, I believe it was Martin Sheen, um, yeah, just did a movie on the uh, walking to the Compostello. Eventually, he'll actually return to Judea for whatever reason. We don't know why, but we know that he is the first of the apostles to be martyred, to be killed for the faith, where he will be beheaded. Which is why James will oftentimes be depicted with a sword. If you look in religious Catholic art, or pretty much any Catholic or Orthodox art, and any time you find a saint holding a weapon, it doesn't mean that that's the weapon that they use to kill people. It means that that's usually the weapon that they were killed with. It means that they were a martyr if they're holding a weapon. Um, and secondarily, if they're ever holding a palm leaf, a palm leaf, which was a sign of that they used palm leaves as they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem and then they killed him a week later, any of the saints who in religious art or in statuary or in mosaics or things like that, if they're holding a palm leaf, or if they're holding a weapon, it means that they were a martyr. They were killed for their faith. And so St. James was the first. John, his younger brother, also called a son of thunder, also referred to in the Gospels as the Beloved. Um, this is actually how John will refer to himself in his own Gospels, um, which I think is interesting. He calls himself the Beloved, the favored disciple of Jesus. Uh, he's most likely the youngest of all the apostles. He was probably about 13, 14, 15 years old at the time of Jesus. Um, he's also the youngest, and also he will live the longest. He's the only apostle of Jesus, only one of the 12 who's chosen by Jesus who actually will not be martyred. Not because of lack of trying, because John will eventually end up in Ephesus, 
the, he will, they will try to boil him alive in oil according to the um, stories as well as the legends. He will survive it, which is actually if you survived a capital punishment um, execution, by Roman law, the Romans would not allow you to be go again. Um, so, for instance, if you somehow managed to survive, it was recognized by the Romans kind of that, well, the gods granted you some type of pardon that for some reason. And so that was part of Roman law. It's actually why St. Cecilia later on in the church, St. Cecilia, um, it was also understood that you could only hack a person's head three times. St. Cecilia, they will hit her three times and they still won't behead her. And then they, the Romans, legally speaking, couldn't, couldn't kill her. Um, and actually, that's why Cecilia will die over a period of days, agonizing and gruesomely, because by Roman law, you couldn't do that. So when John actually survives, it's not unreasonable that, it, that John, when he actually survives, supposedly miraculously without a scratch or without a scar, this uh, su uh, attempted uh, um, killing of him, he will then be exiled to Patmos. And in the exile in Patmos, that's where he will actually write. And actually, if you went, um, I just took a group of people to Greece, and we went to the cave where he wrote the um, book of Revelations, um, as well as uh, possibly the Gospel of John. Eventually, we'll return to Ephesus, where he will die of old age. But again, being in Ephesus, as well as Smyrna, he will establish churches in the islands, as well as in um, Turkey and Greece, and eventually in Patmos, where he will go. And he will also be the last apostle who will be writing, which is why people are starting to ask deeper questions later on, and they're also starting to challenge fundamental things that the, that the apostles, have, that the church have been doing for a while. One of the main things that people are starting to challenge is the Eucharist. Is this actually the body and blood of Jesus? That's already a big, huge thing. And we know the Eucharist was a big, huge thing in the early church because all of the early art, all the early mosaics, all depict the Eucharist. It's a common theme. But people are already starting to deny and say that this is just a nice thing we're doing. And that's why John, actually, in his Gospels, will go into great detail defending, actually, the sacraments. All the sacraments which we're doing, which is why in John's Gospel you'll find all of the sacraments laid out, not just what they are. You'll find what the sacraments are in the other Gospels. You'll find why in John's Gospel, because John's defending them, especially for his community, because people he's living in those areas where people are starting to already deny the realities. St. Philip, again, kind of a realist. If you look at any of his actual writings, uh, the few encounters we have with Philip, um, he's the one who'll say eight months' wages is not enough to buy, even everyone to have a bite of bread. Um, he's also the one who will say to Nathaniel, Nathaniel will say, well, what good can come from Nazareth? Nazareth is a backwater city. And he'll just say, just shut up and come and see. Just come and see. Um, which, again, Philip, we know very little about him. Again, that's where, he, again, if you know me, you'll know me. Philip's response, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough. Philip, don't you know me, even after I've been with you such a long time? Philip, actually, if you want to know where the T-shaped cross, because Jesus most likely was not crucified on a T-shaped cross the way that we oftentimes depict him in art. Jesus most likely, the tradition of the day, how Jesus would have probably been crucified was on what's referred to as a towel-shaped cross, a cross like that. The reason why we even have a T-shaped cross and why we use it is because there was actually confusion. St. Philip, it comes from St. Philip. St. Philip, who was crucified in the Heropolis in Turkey, was actually crucified on a Latin-shaped cross. That's why we actually have the Latin-shaped cross. Um, also where the tradition of the Latin-shaped cross comes from, because Jesus was actually probably, that's why the Franciscans, St. Francis went back to using the towel. If you ever looked at the towel, that's probably, we can't really verify for certain we don't really know exactly what type, because there's different types of crosses that the um, Romans would do. If they had more time, they would put more effort into it. Sometimes a cross just consisted of you being staked to a tree. But if, again, with Andrew, it was at X, again, different themes. We usually, what was most convenient at the time was what they would use. Um, so, again, but actually there's no church which actually still can trace themselves or attempts to trace themselves back to St. Philip. Some of the early apostles, their churches were possibly destroyed, um, or they didn't survive. But actually, there are some who do. You have St. James. Again, there's lots of different names for James, although we don't know if these are three different individuals or just one, but there's what's referred to as James Minor. Um, James was possibly a kinsman of Jesus, and he's the first bishop of Jerusalem. He's also referred to as that, that apostle who was actually taken to the parapet of the temple. It's referred to, and he was actually thrown from the parapet of the temple eventually and that he was crushed, which is why if you look in artwork, James will oftentimes be depicted 
but he actually survives the throwing off of the temple parapet, and they will beat him with clubs to death. Which is why James will oftentimes be depicted with a club. Actually, the Jerusalem church traces itself back to James, and why actually even the liturgy of St. James is still the oldest complete form of the uh, divine liturgy of the Mass, which is said in the Eastern churches. Um, and this is where a lot of people speculate that James was actually a kinsman of Jesus. If you saw the, uh, the new movie, The Young, Young Messiah, it was actually taking some of these, uh, these legends of James. That's where it, James is kind of his cousin, his kinsman. Also explains actually when it says the, in, it says the brothers of Jesus came and saw him, brothers and sisters. The word which is used is a daphos, which in Greek means kinsman. It can mean brother, but actually it also means cousin. That's why a lot of people will associate James as being a cousin of Jesus. Thomas, my favorite, obviously my namesake, the twin, is also the skeptic. He won't believe until he can place his fingers in the side of Christ. Again, he's also the one who in John's chapter he'll say, uh, let us go and die so that we can die with him. If you read this with a sarcastic tone, I think you probably get more of the accurate translation because Thomas is not very happy about being dragged back because he's afraid he doesn't want to die. Let us go and die with him since he's forcing us to go. Actually, when you see it also, Thomas is going to say, Lord, how can we know where you're going? We don't know the way. It gives a practical way of understanding this. It's also why he won't believe these people who are saying that Jesus is risen from the dead and it's his own friends. But he says, I won't believe until I can place my hand into Jesus' side. Again, Thomas goes eventually and ends up in India which is why the St. Thomas Christians to this day, also the Chaldean Church and the Serial Malabar Rites, all trace themselves actually back to St. Thomas and can trace themselves to the Thomas's apostolic authority, um, going back to India. We thought that actually the Indian church um, was destroyed, and we found um, in the 19th century, we found pockets of Christians who could trace themselves actually back to St. Thomas, which was quite amazing, um, because we thought that they had been destroyed by either Hindus or Muslims and things like that, but the church in India had survived. Find St. Bartholomew, again, the one who says, can anything good come from Nazareth? He's also referred to in scriptures as uh, Philip, uh, or I'm sorry, as Nathaniel. Is that possibly a scholar of the law? A lot of people think that he possibly was a scholar or a scribe, a person who was studying the law. That's actually the idiom that Jesus uses when talking to St. Bartholomew is a speech which is also usually referred to with people who studied the law, which is why Bartholomew will sometimes be referred to as a scholar. The Armenian Apostolic Church, still to this day, traces themselves back to St. Bartholomew. St. Bartholomew, who supposedly, um, by tradition, tells us that he was actually skinned alive, um, which was actually a form of torture, which is why if you look in paintings and things like that, Bartholomew will be holding his skin. This is in Rome. And <clears throat> this is Michelangelo's uh, last judgment scene. And if you know from the last judgment, this is actually St. Bartholomew, which is why Bartholomew is holding a knife. So if you look at actually the facade of St. Peter's Basilica, you'll see all the 12 apostles up there. Bartholomew is the one holding the knife. Michelangelo, after dealing with the Pope for three years, painted his own self-portrait into St. Bartholomew's skin. So that's actually what Bar what's, Mike, Michelangelo said. This is what he felt like after finishing the Sistine Chapel and dealing with Julius, <laughs> Pope Julius. Um, so the Armenian church, again, traces themselves to Bartholomew, which is why even art you'll find him being skinned. So Jude, not Judas Iscariot, but Jude Thaddeus. Again, the Armenian Orthodox Church also can tr traces themselves to him. We really know very little bit about him. But again, going to Armenia, again, in the Middle East, you can find that as well as Simon. Simon, we actually know very little about. At Simon, St. Simon, not St. Simon Peter, but the other Simon is the, probably the apostle we know the least about. We don't know really. We know that he probably, possibly was a zealot, might not have been, but that he was, the only thing we really have from tradition is that he was sawed in half after possibly ending up in somewhere in Persia. Um, and he possibly preached with Jude. It's actually interesting if you look, sometimes he'll be depicted with St. Jude, um, St. Simon. There's actually a song which we sing if you open up the Gloria, the Gloria and Praise Book and you look through the, the songs, and there's one which actually goes through all the different apostles, and every time we have a feast of an apostle, we might sing from that particular one. When we get to St. Simon, it says, Oh, Simon, we don't know anything about you, but we're sure that you're holy. <laughs> 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 because some of the, we just don't know. I mean, that's where you get... Um, and that's really what the song says. It's like, we don't really know anything about what you did. 
except that he ended up somewhere in Iran and that those churches didn't survive. Matthew, the tax collector, Jesus chose all of his apostles. You'll notice something about all these men. They all came from various different walks of life. They didn't just come from one particular grouping of people. So why tax collector, he would have been, actually most people would have hated and despised him. They would have considered him a Roman sympathizer or a Roman sellout, um, which is why when Jesus calls him, he would have shocked everyone. It's also he would have been very wealthy, um, but that he gives up all things to follow Christ. Again, Jesus says, I've not come to call those who are healthy. I've come to call the sick. And so Matthew will go out. Matthew will obviously be one of the gospel writers who will leave behind the gospel, and his community will preserve the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew will eventually be killed by the sword. So, and then finally you get to Judas Iscariot. And we'll finish with Judas Iscariot and pick up next week um, after this with St. Paul. Because Judas, again, will obviously betray Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And then will later kiss him to identify him. So not only will he sell him out, but he'll betray him with a sign and an act of love. Which is what Christ has come to do. But eventually he will despair We'll get into, maybe if you come to the RCA, we'll get into some of the reasons for that. But Judas will eventually commit suicide, and he will die. You can read this about in the scriptures. But when, if you look at the Acts of the Apostles, one of the things that will happen is that they recognize that now there is only 11. After Jesus has ascended into the heavens, the apostles recognize that there is now only 11. And so as a result of this, they will meet together, and they will pray with one accord with Mary, the mother of Jesus, in their midst with his brethren, and that they will say, stand up, Peter will stand up speaking on behalf and speaking to say that we need to replace him. We need a new leader. Um, and so what they will do is that they will reference scriptures that at the bottom you say, let his habitation become desolate, there will be no one delivered, let another take his place. So as a result of this, you will have the replacing of Judas Iscariot, who is now dead, with Matthias. Matthias, again, you could say he's the understudy because there's two people who are doing it. I find it very interesting the way that they elected people in the early church, at least at the, the first apostle who's elected. The way that they elect him is by gambling. They basically cast lots, which was a form of gambling, to basically see who wished one the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I've thought that maybe the church should go back to that form for choosing bishops and priests and things like that. But either way, they will cast lots to determine who will take Judas Iscariot's spot because they recognize that they need a new leader that they need someone to come in and take that. Matthias will replace him. Matthias will eventually be stoned in Jerusalem and then beheaded, which is why Matthias will be depicted with an ax. But the choosing of Matthias shows several different important things which also have a huge influence in the early church. The choosing of Matthias shows, one, the authoritative status to, one, choose other people, as well as that the first one is that just because you have been chosen doesn't mean you're going to be holy. Just because you are chosen and you were chosen by Christ doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden going to get it all together. Because you will find even people in the early church, because a lot of people in terms of the Catholic Church or any church have this very accusation that they say, well, why should I go to church? It's filled with hypocrites. I mean, doesn't this disprove the validity of the church? Doesn't this, the very fact, if the church was real, then their, its members should be holy. That's a very, that's often, I'm sure most of us in this room have probably heard that from some fashion or form from some person. This right here is a case and example from Scripture itself that just because a person is chosen, even a person is chosen and given an, a huge place in the kingdom, some people have difficulties with the church in terms of corruption. Various people who have seen bishops or priests or different leaders in the church making mistakes and say, this disproves, this has to disprove the church. We see that Jesus himself chose a man who betrayed him. Jesus himself chose a man who denied him, who sold him out, and who then committed suicide, who did terrible things. So just because a person has a leadership position in the church doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be holy because they still have free will. They still have a choice. And we see that actually from the foundation of the church, you have problems even at the beginning of the church. And when we see problems in the church, this shouldn't be something which tests or likewise undermines our faith. It's actually, I'd say, demonstration of actually the real church. Because if you find a perfect church, I would venture to say that's not the church that Jesus Christ established. <laughs> and I'd venture to say you will never find a perfect church. So two, so one, there's problems from the very earliest times of the church. 
but two, by the very fact that they choose someone to replace Matthias, demonstrates and shows that the apostles have the authority, at least they see themselves as having the authority, which Jesus gave them by the power of the Holy Spirit in chapter 16 and Matthew 28, but that they have the authority to replace and to confect and to transfer authority to others. Now, this is a big, huge, this is the only reason I bring this up, because this is also a big question, is did the apostles, okay, well, Jesus most certainly chose the 12, you can't deny that, but did they have the authority to pass on their authority to others? We see it from Scripture. We see it from the very beginning of time, because this is actually something which the Mormons, who are not Christians, Mormons will actually level against traditional Christians, especially the Catholic Church. They'll say, okay, well, Jesus had authority. Jesus gave the authority to the 12, but the 12 did not have the ability to confect and to bring it and to pass it on. But from scriptures we itself, we see that they do have the authority to pass it on. But this idea also of the transmission and use of authority as well as who has authority in the early church is going to be a huge hot button issue, which is actually why in the early church writers, especially like um, Irenaeus or in people like um, Justin Martyr, they're going to be talking about authority a lot because people are already starting to challenge authority in the early church which is actually why you can say Luke actually makes sure that he inserts this into Acts of the Apostles. Because already at the time of the, of the Apostles, there's already questions of authority because obviously, as the Catholic Church, it is the single united Christian institution in the world, and authority is a very big question. It's a very big issue. Um, the use of authority as well as in the early church, how that authority has been used, and what that authority's purpose is for. Um, but just because you're a 12, Actually, there were more apostles than just the 12. And St. Paul is an example of this, and we'll come back to St. Paul next week. So let's go ahead and close for the night with a prayer, and we'll be up here next week. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together tonight. We ask you to keep us safe on our way home, to give us a restful night, help us to rise again refreshed and joyful in the morning, to praise you tomorrow. And the Lord, help us just to see in your life where you're acting and moving and guiding us to be greater witnesses of the gospel so that we can go out like the apostles and preach the good news and transform our nation, transform our families, and transform the world for the power and the message of your love. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.